Electric cars are great. They're lower emission than internal combustion engine cars. They're cheaper to fuel and mostly cheaper to maintain. Although, I'll be honest, when things rarely go wrong with an EV, they sometimes go wrong in a fairly spectacular expensive way. Governments around the world are mostly on board now with the idea of EVs as being the best way to decarbonize personal mobility. And in a world where most experts agree we've gone sailing past the point of no return when it comes to keeping human-caused global warming changes to below 1.5 degrees Celsius, we need as many people as possible to dump the pump and go electric. Except, well, electric cars, despite what some might have you believe, aren't truly affordable for the majority of the world's citizens. Sure, if you have a decent paying job and you own your own home and you have a disposable income of a decent size, electric cars can be a great solution to your traveling needs. But, if your income or family budget isn't quite as generous about what you can spend where, buying an electric car is still out of your price range. It is likely, though, that micromobility solutions are within your budget. I'm talking about electric bicycles, electric scooters and electric unicycles, all of which have experienced a surge in popularity in recent years. They let you find alternative ways of getting from point A to point B, that don't require a multi-ton vehicle. They can help you rediscover cycling or improve your health. And they can help you arrive without a pool of sweat underneath your feet. Most importantly, they can, in areas with good cycle paths and cycle-friendly policies, be quicker than a car. But, aside from a complex patchwork of legislation governing what's legal and what's not legal where you live, something that does put people off using micromobility in case they're stopped by the police, there's another issue we are going to address today. Much of the world's public transit hasn't kept up with electric micromobility. And that's a big problem because on paper, multimodal transit, that's using different types of transportation for a single journey, is perfect when you use micromobility as part of it. So today, I'm gonna to see how we can change that disconnect between micromobility and public transit. For the most part, micromobility solutions like the ones I've just listed have been adopted by two different groups of people. People who use them for recreational purposes and people who use them to get from point A to point B. Recreational micromobility users often live further out of town than those who use them for commuting purposes. They may have a car and regularly take their rides to specific places at the weekend to have fun, either taking them on a traditional bike route or just an e-bike ride, or taking them off-road to have some more extreme fun. And yes, in case you didn't know, there's an entire community of amazing stunt riders who do tricks on their high-power EUCs, that's electric unicycles, at the weekend, just because they can, and to push that envelope as far as it will go. Those who commute are often pretty close to where they work. They may have a mile or two to ride in each direction and may pair their personal micromobility with other forms of transport when the weather's a bit naff. They may have gotten into using an e-bike or scooter as a replacement for a traditional pedal-powered bicycle or perhaps an internal combustion engine vehicle. And they're enjoying both the reduced costs of ownership and the health benefits from riding to and from work every day. Of course, that latter group can vary widely in age and background and can also vary depending on how micromobility is treated where you live. If your local ordinance doesn't allow electric bicycles on cycle paths, for example, only hardened e-bike fans are likely to ride to and from work. And of course, if you live somewhere with high summer temperatures or super cold winters, that will also impact how many people ride year round. Although, as I pointed out in a previous video last year on micromobility, you'd be surprised how many people will ride a bicycle to work when it's super cold out if the cycle path they're taking is properly maintained and is free from snow and ice. 
But what I would like to focus on in this video is the matter of helping those who live further out use micromobility to get to and from work, pairing it with local public transit in that ultimate multimodal fusion. Many major metropolitan areas now use electric buses, trolley buses and light rail to get people around. But if you live a long way from your nearest public transit stop, you still need a way to get from home to that stop and then back at the end of the day. Sometimes people take a car, but all too often people just skip the mass transit bit and go all the way in their car. Gas prices and traffic jams be damned. At this point, I'd like to acknowledge that not every country and certainly not every city has reliable mass public transit. That's something we need to fix, especially if we're looking for mass decarbonisation of transportation. Along with powering that mass transit using renewable energy, though, I'd also like to acknowledge that even in places with, say, a half-decent rail service, the price of taking the train can be cost prohibitive. Take one look at the confusion that is the UK rail network and its various pricing structures and you're guaranteed to need a lie down and some paracetamol. That's Tylenol for those of you living in North America. Those two very big issues aside though, there's another problem with electric micromobility and public transit. Namely the fact that in many places around the world, you're not actually allowed to bring electric scooters, electric bicycles and UMCs onto public transit. I should note here that there are places where you're welcome to bring your own electric bicycle or micromobility solution on board, but just like the rules that govern where you can ride and when, the rules over what you can bring on board are complex and confusing depending on where you live. In researching this video, for example, I've come to realise that for the most part, electric bicycles are not allowed on bicycle racks, be they in or out of the public transit vehicle. That's because electric bicycles are heavier than conventional bicycles and racking hasn't been beefed up in most municipalities to deal with that. Additionally, in-vehicle racking, as you might find in some light rail or cross-country rail services, may actually hang up bicycles by their wheels, something that is sometimes impossible to do with e-bikes due to their weight and the potential that they will come crashing down onto someone. It's a liability that many transit authorities just won't take on board, like the e-bikes. Fat tyre bicycles, a popular trend in the e-bike world, are also simply too thick to safely accommodate with a traditional bicycle carrier. Other areas allow electric bicycles and micromobility, but only during off-peak periods. In other words, when you're not likely to be commuting to and from work. Others have such wishy-washy rules that you might be allowed on the train or bus on one day when it's empty, but the conductor or guard or driver reserves the right to refuse you entry. And if you've just spent upwards of 1500 on a new e-bike or a scooter or a UMC, you might not just want to leave it at the local bus stop or train station chained to a lamppost. You might think that e-scooters and UMCs would be okay, but again, often not. If it's too big to fit in an overhead bin or next to you in the seat, many transit authorities just say no. Finally, there's the matter of batteries. Electric micromobility has been given a bad reputation in recent years, often thanks to poorly made battery packs in poorly made models with some or often no battery management. Just like certain mobile devices have been banned from certain airlines over the last few years for having temperamental battery packs, so too are some types, or indeed all, micromobility vehicles in some jurisdictions around the world from public transit. While I can understand the logic, it's a matter of reducing liability risks, blanket bans, while easy to implement, throw the metaphorical baby out with the metaphorical bathwater. Luckily though, there are solutions. Some are easy, and some not so much. First, we need to see mass transit operators plan more appropriately for e-scooters, 
e-bicycles, UMCs and other forms of e-transit. They need to communicate more effectively what's allowed and what's not. And when it comes to new fleet purchases, new buses, trains and light rails need to be built and specced with flexible carrying capabilities in mind. That means being able to include everything from proper wheelchair accessible spaces to dedicated safe storage spaces for micromobility and bicycle owners to use. And for what it's worth, I think it is important to communicate to your local politicians that you support spending more money on mass transit in order to make it accessible to everyone. A more reliable, more accessible mass transit system means fewer people choose to drive and sit in traffic and hopefully more people take alternative, lower carbon routes to work. It might even be possible for transit operators to designate certain routes or vehicles as being micromobility friendly using dedicated signs or colour schemes. Next, I want to deal with bus stops and rail stations near to users' homes. It's likely that they're using micromobility to get that first part of their journey carried out in the morning and the last bit out in the evening. They may not even need to take their e-mobility device on mass transit with them because their office or place of work is a short walk at the other end. But if there's no safe storage options where they pick up their bus or train, taking their e-mobility with them may be the only option. In Europe, bicycle lockers are becoming increasingly popular at rail stations, but again, they're often too small for the average e-bicycle, which tends to have a longer frame to accommodate battery pack and motor. Upgrading existing bicycle lockers to accommodate larger e-bicycles and maybe even offering charging during the day could be a great way for transit operators to keep customer steeds safe while also earning some extra money in the process. Next, work with e-mobility and micromobility providers to ensure that models meet required safety standards to safely be transported. Not everybody will like the idea of certification programs, but in Europe, for example, CE certified vehicles would be an obvious starting point. If it's not CE certified, it doesn't get to ride in with everyone else. Finally, we, as cleaner transit advocates and enthusiasts, need to explain to lawmakers and operators the benefit of working with micromobility in a multimodal operation rather than against it. We need more consistent regulations and consistent guidance, more shared spaces and a roadmap that allows everyone to use the cleanest, greenest, most affordable transit options that make sense for them. Only when e-mobility and multimodal go hand in hand will we really start to see the benefits in reduced congestion and reduced emissions, not to mention better health overall. That's it for today. If you like this video, you know what to do and feel free to tip us with a super thanks. The comments are not open for your thoughts because, yeah, you probably saw our video a couple of weeks ago about why we had to close off our comments section, but you are more than welcome to leave your thoughts in our Discord chat room, link below. Or if you are a Patreon supporter, head over to our Patreon pages and leave it there. If you want more from the channel, subscribe, hit the bell and follow the links to regularly support us with a YouTube membership or a Patreon subscription. You'll also find links to our Ko-fi, Bitcoin and swag store. And do check us out on Mastodon, which is another great place to chat with the team. Scrolling on my right is the list of amazing Charged Up supporters and shout outs go out to our self-driving tier supporters. They are Mike Weeder, Tony Moss, Linda Irish, Sean Tucker, Patrick Boyarski, Paul Nelson, Chris Maxwell, Brian Newton, Michael Goad, Bennett Elder, Andrew Martin, Pedro Moore Pinheiro, Brophy Wolf, Chris and Michael Johnson, Tessa in the Gong, Dan Blair, Peter Dillinger, Gordon C, Stephen O'Donoghue, Carl Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Ray Jean Fellows, Denny Hyde, Chris Centaur, and Jim Bernas. Finally, out of this world thanks to our top tier supporters, Robert Flannery, CPU Freak 101, Andrew Glenn, JP Fagerback, Joe Bresney, John Lyons, Rory Litwin, Kevin Burrowbridge, Dave Kitchen, Aaron Hahn, Laura Reynolds, Marcel Ward, Matthew Drobnak, Paul Conway, Reggie Watts, Will Graylin, Ellery Hensley, and Ian. I also want to thank those of you who signed up in the last week to support us and you might not be on that list yet. That doesn't mean we're not grateful for your support because believe me, you've made things so much more happy and sustainable here. I promise we'll get your names on the list as soon as possible. 
I, Kate, or someone else from the team will be back soon with more content, but until then, keep evolving. So if you watched Friday's video, you saw this, the G4 Cube, and I promised you that I was going to make a little video about the weird coincidence between it being in my possession and its former owner. So in case you didn't see Friday's video, it does work. There's no screen right now because I don't have an appropriate period screen to work with it. So if you have one, get in touch because I'd love to have one on set. Um, but this computer, it's going to get a new hard drive very soon. Um, it also has an issue with its power button, which I'm working to fix. But when I picked this cube up, I still lived in the UK and I picked it up from a gentleman in Bath, which was just down the road from where I lived in Bristol. And I didn't chat with him about anything. He just gave me the machine. I think I paid like £10 for it. And I took it home and I used it for a bit and I didn't really think about it. When I got it home, I made a copy of the original hard drive because sometimes it's useful to have software um, that may no longer be available. Um, I generally wipe the hard drives of the original uh, content, but for some reason I didn't with that one. And I kept some of the original documents rather than just the software. And a couple of months ago when I was working here at the house on getting that machine running, I noticed that the hard drive had a folder on it called um, GSMD, which was the initials for my old alma mater, my music college, Guildhall School of Music and Drama. It turns out that that computer, uh, when I clicked on that folder, because I was curious at that point, uh, it turns out that it had a folder called letters to GSMD staff. And in that folder was a, a letter to someone who used to teach me oboe. And I realized because of the age of this machine that the person who had previously owned it not only knew my professors at college, but was working with them on a continuing professional development program and it's just blown my mind that it's just a small world that I ended up having a computer that was owned by someone who worked with my former oboe professor. The world is a very small place sometimes. <laughs>